Winston Churchill once referred to Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. However, the notoriously quotable British leader could just as easily have been describing Howard Hughes, the record-setting aviator, filmmaker, and drug-addled recluse who became the world's wealthiest man. Although many aspects of Hughes's well-publicized life are well-known – opiate addiction, poor hygiene, fear of germs, etc. – he carefully managed to keep highly guarded secrets that remain a mystery to this very day. His involvement in the entertainment industry alone created relentless intrigue by the celebrity-obsessed public, and even post-mortem, Hughes's stranger-than-fiction persona continues to fascinate as well as generate countless bogus stories, augmenting his enduring legacy. In today's video, we take a deeper look at Howard Hughes. Number 10. Comic Book Superhero Marvel Comics icon Stan Lee saw Howard Hughes as the ideal inspiration for the character Tony Stark, better known by his alter ego, Iron Man. Lee collaborated with fellow writers and artists Jack Kirby, Larry Leiber, and Don Hegg to create Stark as a fabulously wealthy playboy and industrialist who first appeared as a character in the March 1963 issue of Tales of Suspense No. 39. Howard Hughes was one of the most colorful men of our time. He was an inventor, an adventurer, a multi-billionaire, a ladies' man, and finally, a nutcase. Iron Man and later The Avengers became a highly profitable movie franchise starring Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Interestingly, Hughes and Downey both share a notorious reputation for drug abuse and erratic behavior. However, the diminutive actor, 5 foot 9 inches, does require superpowered lifts to match Hughes's towering 6 foot 3 height. Number 9. Crash and Earn Hughes's interest in aviation developed at an early age. Hughes's father, a successful Houston businessman who made a fortune developing oil drilling equipment in Texas, brought him flying lessons when Junior was only 14. This began an obsession that would involve spending lots of loot setting around the world flight records while also making bundles of money developing advanced aircraft for the US government. He also destroyed several planes and cars, nearly killing himself on numerous occasions. During the making of his epic World War I movie Hell's Angels, Hughes insisted on attempting a risky stunt in a biplane, despite only being a novice pilot at the time. He crashed hard shortly after takeoff at Mines Field, now LAX Airport, breaking bones in his face that required extensive surgery. In the spring of 1943, Hughes lost control of an amphibian Sikorsky 43 over Lake Mead, killing two people on board. His next crash, however, it would drastically alter his life forever. On July 7, 1946, Hughes plowed into a Beverly Hills neighborhood, demolishing three houses while piloting an X-11, a military reconnaissance prototype of his own design. As a result, he suffered multiple serious injuries, leading to a lifelong addiction to opiate-based painkillers. Number 8. Don Juan de Tejas Tall, handsome, and determined to make a name for himself, Howard Hughes could have easily been mistaken for a young actor upon his arrival to Hollywood in 1925. Being a millionaire didn't hurt either, as he quickly built a reputation as a major player and notorious womanizer. His dalliances included a who's who of Tinseltown's leading ladies such as Catherine Hepburn, Rita Hayworth, Joan Crawford, Susan Hayward, Ginger Rogers, Lana Turner, Ava Gardner, and even the sisters Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine. While the Me Too movement continues to expose the industry's shameful past, the Hughes era could have been sort of seen as a golden age of sexism and exploitation, just a really nasty golden age. The powerful studio heads frequently stayed at the Beverly Hills Hotel, where they kept scores of women in different bungalows, providing the convenience to slip in and out of various love nests undetected. Additionally, Hughes seemed to enjoy collecting starlets as much as bedding them. He made it a practice to sign young hopefuls to long-term binding contracts, a devious act of deception that prevented talent from working for his competitors while allowing him to sell their services to bidding studios. Furthermore, as a total control freak, his debilitating injuries, drug dependency, and paralyzing OCD would have greatly compromised his libido and or possibly rendered him impotent and left him craving other forms of action. Number 7. Above the Law Then and now, being rich and famous can be helpful in making problems disappear, and that even includes manslaughter. On the night of July 11, 1936, Hughes got behind the wheel of his Duesenberg Roadster following dinner and drinks with a date. He later struck a pedestrian named Gabriel S. Meyer, a 59-year-old salesman who died at the scene not far from Hughes's mansion in Los Angeles. The wealthy Texan was booked on suspicion of negligent homicide after witnesses told police that Hughes had been driving erratically as Meyer stood in the safety zone of a streetcar stop. Following a coroner's inquiry, eyewitness accounts abruptly changed to support the driver's claim that Meyer had stepped in front of a slow-moving car. Hughes's case also benefited from District Attorney Burren Fitz, whose checkered career involved favorable acquittals in other high-profile cases, including the questionable suicide of Paul Byrne, the husband of his Hells Angels star, Gene Harlow. 
In the end, Hughes walked away scot-free minus court costs and a token $10,000 gift to the victim's family. Number 6. Howard Hughes Air Force Hughes spared no expense buying vintage World War I aircraft in an effort to make the dogfights in Hells Angels look as realistic as possible. The aerial combat scenes thrilled audiences and helped pioneer several innovative camera techniques. Moreover, his maniacal demands led to the death of three stunt pilots and a mechanic. During the often delayed shoot, Hughes managed to acquire a great number of planes. American-made biplanes were also disguised to resemble warbeds for both Allied and enemy squadrons. Additionally, a massive twin-engine Sikorsky S-29A received a heavy makeover for its transformation into a German Gotha bomber. All totaled, Hughes bought or leased roughly 40 planes, although he often exaggerated the number to nearly 100, and he also hired an elite corps of leading stunt pilots, barnstormers, and World War I aces to fly them. As a gifted hype man, the director and producer Producer often boasted that he had assembled the largest air force in the world, despite this claim being patently false. Number 5. The Outlaw Self-Promoter For many cinema buffs, the story behind the making of the movie The Outlaw is far more entertaining than the clunky western that Hughes directed and produced. Nonetheless, in spite of its flaws and controversies, the film became a box office hit and it launched the career of Jane Russell, as well as spawned the apocryphal tale that the breast fetish billionaire invented the push-up bra. He did not. In 1940, Hughes discovered Russell as an unknown 19-year-old buxom brunette and immediately signed her to an exclusive seven-year contract. The mogul then cast her in the leading role of Rio, a sexy senorita caught in a love triangle between gunslingers Doc Holliday and Billy the Kid. The infatuated filmmaker instructed his legendary cinematographer Greg Toland, Citizen Kane, the best years of our lives, to prominently feature Russell's cleavage throughout the movie and even constructed a crude garment with wires to further showcase her voluptuous figure. Russell, however, she had other ideas. In her autobiography, the actress described the ham-handed design as ridiculous and uncomfortable and she never wore it. Instead, she fooled her bosom-obsessed boss by simply padding her bra with tissue paper. She said, He could design planes, but a Mr. Playtex, he wasn't. The discarded underwear would be one of numerous setbacks for the black and white OTA. The Production Code Administration PCA, an agency which set the entertainment industry's moral guidelines, condemned the movie's salacious 38D theme, which included scenes involving bondage and implied rape. Following the limited screening of an altered cut, critics were equally disgusted, prompting Hughes to pull the film from theaters. He then hatched an ingenious strategy, underscoring his strengths as a resourceful businessman and a master of self-promotion. Hughes unleashed a relentless publicity campaign targeting religious leaders, women's clubs, and other conservative groups to ban his lewd picture. The scheme ultimately worked, as public outcry demanded to see the hype's production, leading to its 1946 wide release, and this was supplemented with tawdry production stills and posters declaring, how do you like to tussle with Russell? Number 4. Put it to bed Hugh spent a total of 37 days convalescing in a hospital bed following his near-fatal XF-11 disaster. The violent impact in exploding fuel tanks left him with a broken collarbone, cracked ribs, a multi-punctured lung, and third-degree burns. Predictably, the early prognosis appeared bleak, and doctors would describe his recovery as nothing short of a miracle. During his downtime at Good Samaritan in Los Angeles, the same hospital where Bobby Kennedy later died after being assassinated, the workaholic tycoon sought to correct flaws with the XF-11 design, despite his compromised condition and his drug-induced stupor. His stationary predicament it also prompted him to make notes regarding improvements to the hospital bed's design, especially for longer-term patients. Newspaper reporters, hungry for any information about his recovery, helped promote the supposed medical breakthrough, detailing how the wounded genius invented a motorized, adjustable bed that that could be controlled from an elaborate aircraft-style cockpit. Although this type of sensational journalism helped sell newspapers, the veracity of this is highly debatable. So in November of 1945, a year before Hughes's infamous crash, an article appeared in Life magazine about an LA doctor's invention called the push-button bed. The feature, replete with photos, included the passage piloting the bed like an airplane from a panel of switches, while listing several of the same features attributed to Hughes. To be fair, given the famous aviator's background in design and mechanics, it's plausible that Hughes could have conjured up something similar, but once he had recuperated and returned home, no bed patents were ever filed. Number 3. License to Drill while patrolling in the Pacific Ocean in the spring of 1968, a Soviet submarine carrying nuclear-armed ballistic missiles accidentally sank, killing all 98 crew members on board. 
The USSR spent the next two months frantically searching for the wreckage of K-129, but ultimately they never located it. The US, however, soon found it and eagerly launched a covert operation to recover the sunken vessel, believing it contained vital information. Naturally, they called Howard Hughes to the rescue. Codenamed Project Azorian, government officials partnered with the famous industrialist to construct a $350 million drill ship capable of extracting a 1,750-ton sub located three miles below the water's surface. The CIA devised an elaborate cover story, stating Hughes had built the massive contraption as part of his latest commercial venture to mine valuable minerals on the ocean floor. In a recently declassified memo, an intelligence analyst described him as the ideal front to carry out their top-secret scheme, stating, Mr. Howard Hughes is recognized as a pioneering entrepreneur with a wide variety of business interests. He has the necessary financial resources, he habitually operates in secrecy, and his personal eccentricities are such that news media reporting and speculation about his activities frequently range from the truth to utter fiction. The Glomar Hughes Explorers officially began operations in the summer of 1974 and was almost immediately plagued with mechanical issues. Additionally, news media rumors began to surface about the subterfuge following a burglary at Hughes's summer corporation headquarters that revealed documents linking the agency with the Explorer. Eventually, the entire costly project was scrapped to appease the Soviets, but on a positive note, the ruse later inspired the plot for the James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. Number 2. The Man Who Killed John Wayne the 1956 movie The Conqueror by the Hughes-owned RKO Pictures generally ranks as one of the worst films that were ever made. The ill-fated production starring John Wayne in the hopelessly miscast role of the Mongolian leader Genghis Khan not only died at the box office, but later led to several deaths of the cast and crew. Shot over 12 weeks in southern Utah Snow Canyon, the remote location was chosen to replicate Asia's Gobi Desert. This was an utter failure consistent with the cringeworthy dialogue that included lines like this. I feel this Tartar woman is for me, and my blood says take her. Wayne's equally ridiculous black wig and slanted eye makeup all contributed to make The Conqueror a soundly defeated project. But the real tragedy occurred years afterwards when nearly a hundred members of the cast and crew developed cancer, as well as many Native Americans who served as extras portraying Mongolian warriors. During the Cold War years between 1951 and 1962, the Atomic Energy Commission the AEC detonated over 100 bombs in the Nevada desert. The fallout resulted in massive plumes of radioactive dust blowing downwind in the valleys and canyons of southern Utah, inadvertently contaminating everything in its path. Hughes further exacerbated the situation by having 60 tons of radioactive dirt shipped from Utah to Hollywood so filming could be completed on RKO sound stages. The toxic hazard would gravely affect Wayne, the director Dick Powell, and co-stars Susan Hayward, Pedro Armendariz, and Agnes Moorhead, all of whom eventually died from various forms of the deadly disease. Although the iconic and controversial actor known as the Duke had been a heavy six-pack-a-day smoker, he eventually succumbed to stomach, not lung cancer, in 1979. Perhaps out of guilt, Hughes purchased every copy of the film which he kept away from public viewing until three years after his death. Number 1. White House for Sale After losing to John F. Kennedy in the 1960 presidential election, Richard Nixon blamed his narrow defeat on a nagging scandal involving none other than Howard Hughes. Nixon's brother, Donald, had received a loan of $205,000 for his failing drive-in restaurant in 1957, a payment many perceived as an attempt to curry favor with the then vice president. But by 1968, and proving time and money heals old wounds, the man known as Tricky Dick gladly accepted $100,000 in cash from Hughes shortly before moving into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. According to Hughes's chief executive of Nevada operations, Robert Mayhew, his employer told him repeatedly, there is no person in the world that I can't either buy or destroy. Greed, paranoia, and a mafia-connected banker named Charles Bebe Rebozo would all factor in the eventual serpentine downfall of Nixon's presidency. Rebozo, a Cuban immigrant who became a wealthy businessman and close friend of the president, served as the bagman for the illicit funds from Hughes. The money was then allegedly used to fix up Nixon's floor a hideaway dubbed the Winter White House. The stupendously twisted plot also involved a lobbyist working for Hughes named Larry O'Brien, and if that name rings a bell, it's because he later became the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the DNC, with an office at a place called Watergate. Several years later, O'Brien would play a pivotal role in the ABA-NBA merger and help increase basketball's popularity with lucrative TV deals while serving as the commissioner of the NBA, but, well, obviously that's a different story. Terry Lenzer, a chief Senate Watergate investigator, said that he believed Hughes's bribe to Nixon may have led to the break-in that started the chain of events and the cover-up, which culminated with Nixon's resignation in 1974. He stated, The president was absolutely focused on Larry O'Brien when he became chairman of the Democratic National Committee, because 
because Mr. O'Brien had worked for Mr. Hughes as well. The Senate investigation never directly implicated Hughes, partly because he may have given money to high-ranking politicians from both parties. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. If you want to learn more about Howard Hughes, I've done a video about him, a biography about him on my other channel called Biographics. I'm going to link to that below, so please go check it out. Also put a link on the screen. And as always, thank you for watching.